This is an interview that I conducted uh, many years ago with uh, Jim Polk, who was a Pulitzer Prize winner in uh, newspaper journalism, but then was hired by uh, NBC to become their investigative reporter. TV in those days did not do much uh, that we would call investigative reporting. And so uh, he, he felt like, as he mentions in the interview, that uh, he was while he was new at broadcasting and had lots to learn, uh, that he felt like the TV network also had lots to learn about investigative reporting. You have worked both in the print medium and, and in the broadcast medium. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about uh, how you made the switch, why you made the switch, and how difficult the switch was. I made the, the change from newspapers to television, I think because, primarily because I'd done newspapers for about 15, 16 years uh, for Associated Press in the Midwest and then in Washington, and then for the Washington Star. At that point, I had won a Pulitzer Prize, and NBC came around saying, because uh, I was in that year's crop, would you like to be our investigative reporter? After about 15 years in newspapers, I, you know, I was repeating myself. I was going in a rut of doing the, the same stories again and again, uh, different content, but the techniques weren't all that different. It would be uh, somewhat frank. I think I mastered it, and I was running out. You get in a cubby hole as an investigative reporter, or in other areas. You get quite good at it. They want to keep a good person at it rather than give you a new challenge and try to find somebody else good to fill the slot. NBC came along and said, would you like to be our investigative reporter? Frankly, I didn't think they knew how to do investigative reporting for television in 1975, right after Watergate. They didn't know how to do it on a daily basis. And I sure didn't know how to do television. I thought it would be fun for both of us to try. It turned out to be, it is fun. It was just the mid-career change I needed to be excited. You come down from Watergate, I don't care what you say, the techniques are the same, you know, you're still just being a hard-headed reporter, but the stakes, the cast of characters, the governmental crisis is so intense, the stakes are so high, there's a certain letdown that there will never be another story like this, and I'm, like most of us, I would hope that it would not be. Not knowing how to do television, television having problems when it had to generate its own facts, generate its own information, be responsible for it, and be able to communicate it in what it always always had considered, you know, the eyewitness medium. Look, this is what we went out and saw, rather than this is what we went out and found. That thought it would be difficult and therefore fun. Thought it would be challenging, thought it would be hard for them to do, hard for me to do, has been. That's why it's been fun. Most of the time, we are, um, we've, I think I've mastered television a little better than they've mastered investigative reporting. Uh, so it continues to be exciting because it's not easy. Difficulties of changing from uh, newspapers to television. I think it's, it's Fred Friendly's line about the 2,000 pound pencil. What it means is television is a very cumbersome medium. I do just as much reporting in gathering information for a television story as I do for a newspaper story. My files, and, you know, I'm surrounded in this office by three filing cabinets and exceptional with some IRE files. They're story files. Files are just as thick. Now, from a distance you would think the problem with television is you get so little time to tell a story. That's not the problem. You tell a minute and a half television story, which is the basic, this is today's story, this is what happened today, it is about 10 or 12 paragraphs. The essence of a newspaper story is in the first 10 or 12 paragraphs. In fact, if a newspaper reporter has not told the story, breaking story, pretty completely, in those 10 or 12 paragraphs, he's going to have, he or she, is going to have lost the reader. We cut to the uh, core of the information. We just don't have the extra quotes and the extra statistics and, uh, and some of the extra details. When I say it's difficult, 
the writing is much more difficult because there are fewer words to use. It's like writing the, the hardest story, the hardest sentence to write in a newspaper story is the first one, the one that has to be a summary of the information, therefore a little general, somewhat general, accurate, accurate when it's general, and interesting, interesting enough to have the hook to keep the reader going. Why this is different, tragic or emotional or significant interesting why it's important all that you know and then 30 words are left that's the first sentence when people write newspaper stories they really work on this first two three paragraphs and then it sort of spills out after that because they've got about as much space as they need to use we don't have that much space in a television story every sentence is like that first sentence cut to the core of the information that takes actually more intelligence than letting it spill out to be able to, to, to find the essence of the information, be accurate, in fewer words, and be interesting. And you only get one chance to tell a television story. You can tell it at a time of our choosing, 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night, middle of the dinner hour. If you're listening with half an ear or distracted for, for a couple of seconds, that information keeps on tumbling by. So unlike a newspaper story, you can read it at a time of your choosing, or more importantly, go back and if you're not certain what was said, go back and reread the second or third paragraph. Let your eye jump back up to see if you got it right. But the communication is difficult. But, but we can do that. We can do it. We do it pretty, given the difficulty of absorbing information with the ear rather than the eye. Television stories are told in sound. As much as the picture may be there and the popular concept is people get television news by watching. The truth is, almost all the information conveyed in television is conveyed by sound. The reporter's voice talking over the picture, telling them through the ear what they're seeing. Other people talking, what we call the sound buyer, the talking head, commenting, just like the quote. It's all information in words and it comes through the ear. All right, we can recognize that we're fairly good at communicating. One of the things that surprised me when I went from newspapers over to television is how intelligent the people who work in television are. It doesn't always filter through the camera because when you're simplifying information, going to its essence, cutting the course, sometimes you make it sound simple, and therefore the viewer may assume the people bringing you that news are simple. They're not. Uh, they're very bright. By and large, they tend to be very nice because there's no time in television uh, to lose one's cool, to be angry with others. That's not a luxury. You just can't afford the time to get mad or be surly or be curt. you got to keep on working. Come back to that 2,000-pound pencil. The biggest problem in television is the time it takes to put together the story to gather it, record it on camera, to look at the tapes, to decide what you're going to use, and then to edit it. A fair rule of thumb, you know, most of the, most of the, uh, the, the stories on television, the packages, the reporters put together within, within the anchors who we did, are all edited in advance. As much as some, some of them done as shortly as a minute or two minutes before airtime, but they're on a tape cassette. Rule of thumb, even under pressure, is about an hour and a half of editing for every one minute of a package. Or you can cut that down really tightly to 45 minutes if you have to. But an hour, hour and a half of editing for every one minute. That's just editing. On a long story, on a long, we're doing one now on the exodus of Salvadorans from El Salvador and the war conditions of the United States. The bottom line in that story is 10% of El Salvador's population now lives illegally in this country. This will be about a four-minute story we'll air in the next 10 days. To do that four-minute story, we have shot in Washington, in San Francisco, and on the border above Tijuana. We have shot for four minutes of airtime, we have shot a total of 10 to 12 hours of videotape. There will be a place in there where a draft dodger, 18-year-old draft dodger, says, you know, uh, people are dying. I don't want to die. Not me, I don't want to die. 
takes him seven seconds to say that. The interview lasted 40 minutes on tape. Travel time to and from San Francisco, locating him, set up, breakdown, half a day. I mean, I mean half a day spread out over five days altogether. Uh, another place, a uh, person walks out, wrote a letter home. Three brothers and a cousin living in a, living in a, in a one-room apartment, room with a view. Looks down the street at the White House, standing on the balcony, back to the camera. You know, I wrote that I lived near Reagan's house. Lasted maybe five or six seconds. Two hours of shooting, talking around there. He used that, that example of the the proliferation of the illegal Salvadoran, or up, up at 4.30 in the morning to go over and arrive at about 5.15 of the, before dawn at the Jefferson Memorial and the Lincoln Memorial for that one shot that lasts seven or eight seconds of the illegal Salvadoran wetback who came here this summer pushing the mop across the marble at the base of Abraham Lincoln. Time consuming. That's the problem. Public television is so much work gathering the information, gathering the sound and the pictures, and putting it together. It took three and a half days just to look at all those tapes in New York before I wrote it. But it cuts down on the available time to report. That's the real time limitation of television. The amount of work in the, involved in the communications process above and beyond the reporting process. And that was, the, I think, the hardest thing to adjust to. I still work as hard on gathering information on every story. I find that 2,000 pound pencil, the cumbersome nature of television, limits the number of stories I can do. I, I can keep fewer apples and oranges in the air at the same time. Newspaper reporter finishes, right an hour, hour and a half. On a major project, stop shooting, start work, another six, seven, eight days before airtime. Now, on, on the one day story, somebody went for the grand jury, this is a trial. The story's just like a newspaper story started and finished in the same day, same time frame. But still with allowances for all those problems of, of visual communication. Now that's that's one of the major differences uh, in, in television. Uh, I'm talking a long time giving you the answer to the first question, but uh, another difference between television and newspapers are no inside pages. We'll bring you the top eight, 10 stories of the day. Whether they're three stories or whether they're 18, we'll bring you eight to 10, but there isn't any inside pages. There's no page three, and there's no page five, and there's no page seven, so there are no secondary stories. So you can't do piecemeal stories. You can't do part of a story that might make page three, seven, or nine, and someday evolve to page one. That doesn't happen in television. Uh, if there's an evolving secondary story, television will wait until it's a complete story on page one, another difference. But by and large, you know, I'll tell you, I, I don't hold a great deal of a, uh, I won't make a great defense of local television other than a note for investigative reporting on local television, for actually getting out and being not a repeater, but a reporter. There is more and more, and the quality is constantly improving because I, I judge one of those contests nationally. I'm amazed at some of the things local television is doing apart from uh, the happy talk news. For national television, because I travel a lot, and read newspapers. I'll generally get a better summary of what's important outside that local backyard of a small town, nationally and worldwide, on any one of the network's primary evening news programs than I will in the local paper, which primarily covers the local backyard. In making your uh, adjustment to TV, were there any awkward moments? Uh, you, you have a good voice. Was that something you had to work on when you made the transition? Uh, did you feel not, it? not really. Uh, my voice comes from too many cigarettes, too much scotch, and primarily because when I was 16 years old with a squeaky voice and a lot of pimples, I started talking down in my throat, so I'd seem older and a little more male than a, a pimply-faced, squeaky voice kid is at 16. Um, I had to learn in television that just telling the story isn't enough; that you have to emphasize words that you have to work to communicate people because they, they only have that one, one opportunity to listen. And that took an adjustment. And I'm still not entirely comfortable with, with it. Uh, but, you know, network television looks, requires reporters first before communicators. And they'll have more patience with a, patience with a person uh, learning the communication techniques 
than the rule the prisoner can't report. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned a couple of times the, the fleeting nature of TV news that kind of you know goes by you and then it's gone. If you don't catch it the first time, you can't go back to the third paragraph. Uh, in talking to another broadcast journalist who made the transition, he said that was terribly frustrating to him that he, uh, uh, he, he it's hard for his for him to deal with that. That uh, you know he's so used to people being able to to uh, you know come up and and uh, you know tell him about a story and then sharing it with somebody else and uh, he, he just television doesn't leave any clippings behind, does it? Yeah. No. Uh, but I think newspaper reporters. If they think other people other than themselves read their clippings a day later, uh, they're deluding themselves. Uh, newspaper reporting is just as transitory a day later as television reporting is um, for most of the public. And those who have a special interest in the subject matter could go back and pull the clips, and they're the only people who ever do, including the reporters themselves when they put together their prize package, their prize entry. Uh, it's nice to go back and look at your work, but uh, as far as informing the public, they're, they're both transitory uh, processes. Perhaps uh, uh, in, doesn't matter, in either print or, or broadcast, um, you could tell us some, uh, some of your more exciting stories that you, uh, that you covered. It's, it's hard to say this story is exciting, that story is exciting. Uh, there are stories that are exciting because of the stakes, water deep. There are stories that are exciting because of the difficulty, and just the, the, the time difficulty, getting the thing out of the edit room one minute before airtime. There are stories that are complicated to gather the information uh, that are exciting. Yeah. I have what I call the you know, crook of the month club, somebody done something wrong, songs, sleaze and slime, corruption and crime beat. And over the years, well, what it, well not just Watergate and Agnew and all that stuff, uh, and Bobby Besco and uh, the Watergate money. Since I've come to NBC, what have we done? You do it by names, names will make news. Bo Calloway is a uh, Ford campaign manager with the Federal Intervention on the Ski Resort, and uh, Bert Lance, Billy Carter, and some place in between Richard Allen and Raymond Donovan, and the Abscam congressman and the other congressmen like Dan Flood of Pennsylvania, and Otto Passman, Louisiana, and the Herman Talmadge ethics hearings, and, and a lot of other good stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with politics, like, like tax fraud and the children of Jonestown which was a satisfying story. And all that tragedy is satisfying still if you report it well, how the children got there. Well, what's, a, what's a real tragedy in shipping the kids to Johnstown? Was a uh, three-part series on, on murder and insanity. What do we do with the people who are insane when they kill? Um, no answers. Trying to identify the questions. Um, satisfying when you could take a topic and think you explain it well. Uh, probably did a decent job on Tylenol, decent job on the Atlanta murders, Greensboro, the Klan slings. Interrupting the uh, interview just to uh, acquaint you perhaps a little bit more with some of these scandals that uh, you uh, at your age don't, uh, I may not have ever heard of even. The Watergate scandal you may have heard of because it's uh, made into a, a famous movie uh, with uh, Robert Redford and so forth. And uh, uh, the Watergate was uh, the scandal that led to the resignation of uh, President Richard Nixon. And so this is a, a short uh, summary of what Watergate was all about. Uh, the Watergate scandal was a major political scandal that occurred in the United States in the 1970s as a result of the June 17, 1972 break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate office complex in Washington, D.C. And the uh, Richard Nixon administration's attempt to cover up, um, attempt to cover up of its involvement. When the conspiracy was discovered and investigated by the U.S. Congress, the, the Nixons 
uh, administration's resistance to its probes led to a constitutional crisis. The term Watergate has come to encompass an array of clandestine and often illegal activities undertaken by members of the Nixon administration. Those activities included such dirty tricks as bugging the offices of political opponents and people of whom Nixon and his officials were suspicious. Another, uh, he just uh, mentioned in passing, was uh, Abscam. I'm trying to turn to that slide, and it's uh, not going to another slide. Pause here. Another of the scandals that he covered, uh, he, he just mentioned very briefly, was called Abscam. Sometimes... Uh, uh, anyway, it was a Federal Bureau of Investigation sting operation that took place in the late 1970s and early 1980s, the two-year investigation that initially targeted trafficking in stolen property and corruption of prestigious businessmen was later converted to a public corruption investigation. The FBI, aided by the Justice Department and a convicted con man, videotaped politicians accepting bribes from a fraudulent Arabian uh, company in return for various political favors. More than 30 political figures were investigated, and among these 30, a total of seven congressmen, six members of the United States House of Representatives, and one United States senator were convicted. Oh, this too was a major scandal. A third story he mentioned, uh, again fairly quickly, was called Jonestown. It was the informal name for the People's Temple Agricultural Product Project uh, formed by an American religious organization under the leadership of Jim Jones in northwestern Guyana. It became internationally notorious when, on November 18, 1978, 913 people died, most of them in the remote commune. All but two of the deaths were from cyanide poisoning in an event termed revolutionary suicide by Jones and some members on an audio tape of the event and in prior discussions. The poisonings in Jonestown followed the murder of five others by Temple members, including U.S. Congressman Leo Ryan. While the religious leaders called it a mass suicide, others, including Jonestown survivors, regarded the event as a mass murder. That, too, was a very tragic, as he mentioned in the interview, uh, many of the Victims were children who clearly could not have uh, voluntarily subjected themselves to suicide, um, but were murdered by these religious leaders. Now, the real question is what stories are exciting? The answer is every story should be. For the reporter who starts out in the small town with long hours, long unpaid hours, if he or she wants to do the job well, difficulty as always in who's telling the truth and who's trying to con you, who's trying to use you, who knows what he or she is talking about and who's just giving you their conclusions and assumptions and suspicions and accusations, all that. Low paid, not much reward. I assume you're going to do the job well, so there's not really that much pat on the back from the boss or from the peers, and certainly not from the public. Frustrating, finding out difficult it is. If the beginning reporter doesn't find that the most exciting thing that he or she has done or will do so exciting and satisfying that they'd be willing to spend the rest of their life on that same job. If they don't find it that exciting and satisfying, they won't get the opportunity to leave. It's got to be fun. Dan Rather has a line. If you're a reporter and you're sent out on a stakeout and was waiting for somebody to come out and comment, let's say it's in the middle of the night and it's a farm lane and you're outside a house waiting for somebody to come out and talk, standing out there all night, raining, 
up to your ankles in mud. Dawn comes, morning comes, nobody comes out and talks. If you don't find that to be fun anyway, you don't belong in the business. Have you had uh, any stories that you've found just simply frustrating because you haven't been able to break them? Sometimes? You're always frustrated when you can't find, can't resolve either way which way the truth lies. Yeah, that's frustration. When you don't know, it's a frustration. And if you don't know, you don't go with it. Those are the stories that died. Not because any other handicapped somebody, somebody killed the story. You know, when you beat your head up against the wall and you still can't find out what happened, those are frustrating. Uh, do the job the best you can, you still can't sort it out. Uh, not enough to, when, well, you got to sort it out to know which way it went, where the truth was, to put it on the air or in print. And there, there are always a few of those. You see, most stories are killed, not by an editor, and I've never seen it by an advertiser or a publisher. It just not, doesn't happen that way. Most stories are killed by reporters who give up on them. Some you're going to have to give up on after you've done the best you can do, and you still don't know. But uh, the biggest problem are the stories people just quit on, and quit on rather early. Because it looks like they're going to wind up banging the head on the wall and they might be able to find out which way it went. Or you still should go all the way. You, you just get the uh, calluses on your forehead. you got to keep on banging. You can't give up too soon. Uh, you'll lose the story. John Chancellor has a line I love. Says he's known more than a few lucky reporters in his lifetime. He's never known a single lazy lucky reporter. How do you see yourself? Uh, some some journalists say you have to have a, a missionary zeal. Uh, you know, some people accuse, accuse of being prophets of doom, and some seem to see themselves as kind of teachers and others TV stars, uh, supposedly. How do you see yourself? Oh, I see myself as a throwback. I think I'm a simple old reporter. None. I'm not trying to change the world. I have, uh, you know, I've got some ideals. I've got a, uh, a certain sense of propriety that is mine. News, news is subjective. Particularly, you know, if somebody done something wrong stories, whether it's policy or pronouncement or investigative reporting, that's subjective. That's the reporter's own first judgment. Hey, it shouldn't have been this way. Let's, 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 let's not try to, to, to paint that one over. It's a reporter's sense of, uh, of impropriety if it gets a reporter started on, a, on that type of, any kind of, in, in, well, just plain old reporting as opposed to repeating. repeating. These are some questions that, hey, they have, have an answer. These. Let's go out and see where the answers are and where the truth is and what did happen. Generally, it's not because they're looking at something they think was nice. Something that kind of leaves their stomach a little uneasy. Uh, that's subjective, and that uh, starts from a sense, well, may, it shouldn't have been that way, maybe the world should have been a little better. And if you lose that, you'll lose your, your quest for, for information. So, that's in most reporters, admitted or otherwise. You know, you know the, the cynics are, are disappointed idealists. Uh, with a certain bitterness or, or acceptance of a world other than what they'd like it to be. But the key thing is other than what they'd like it to be. Uh, once you've made the subjective news judgment, your attitudes are not going to persuade the public. Your own philosophies aren't going to persuade the public. Only the facts will, and you put it out in a fair way, this is what happened, and then, depends on what the public's common sense attitude toward propriety is. Apathy, apathy is, or like it or not, a legitimate political, with a small p, public response. The public says, well, yeah, no big deal. That's the, the, a final judgment the public 
is entitled, the only person, person's entitled to make, no big deal. Right. Keep on going. Your job is done for him. Now, if you started maybe with, with, always got a subjective sense. Your job is done for him and make the information available to the public and wherever the reactions may go. If they go nowhere, it's, I don't think it's a reporter's job to drum up response. I strongly disagree with those who try to orchestrate reaction and investigations. So and that's why I'm, I'm a dinosaur that way. You just, just like the simple old reporter, try to tell the truth wherever it lies about things that uh, I think the public should know. Uh, that's not changing the world. Maybe just making, trying to make sure people are aware of the world. News is sort of an on call sun as an early warning system. What's going to jump out of the dark and go boo and maybe affect your life? Uh, that's most of the news. People say, yeah, news is doom and gloom. News is what people talk, talk about. I went back this last spring. I come from a very small town in Indiana. And in the next town over, I've got an aunt who turned 90 this spring. Went back to talk to Aunt Mary and just visited her for a couple of days and made some notes on what she told me. She talked about the weather. She talked about taxes, a little problem with Social Security and, and the withholding on, on, on bank savings with taxes and politics there. She talked about death. So the bank president, Steiner Bond, died. Talked about, yeah, talked about sex. Said the uh, bank vice president's wife had run off of the cashier. Told me about scandal. Said the mayor and the county seat been under indictment for lying to a grand jury. And back to politics. Said the mayor would probably be reelected anyway because his opponent was not only a Catholic, what's worse, he was a Democrat. Well, that's roughly what news is. It's taxes and weather and death and sex and politics and scandal. News is what my Aunt Mary talks about. That's what people talk about. And all those folks across the breadth of land who think us eastern shore pointy heads of liberals are to blame for what's on the air. Uh-uh. I was picking on some poor old 90-year-old widow lady in a small southern Indiana town. Because that's what news judgment is. What is it then that uh, that makes it satisfying to you? Are you just, uh, are you a born gossip? <laughs> what is it? Uh, or is it that you like to know first? Uh, what is the motivation? That that's a good way to put it. It's not a born gossip. But you know what I think it is? Let me start with something a little more philo philosophical and serious first. All sorts of things warp news judgment. One of them is what I call the proprietary nature of a story. If we got the story first, be we the New York Times, be we the Washington Post, be we NBC, if it's our story, it was exclusive, we found it first. It acquires a greater currency, a greater value. It's more likely to make page one than page three if it's ours alone. Look at the New York Times and the Post. The ones the New York Times found first tend to be on page one of the Times and page seven of the Post. And conversely, it's a proprietary nature of news. It's our story. On a broader scale, a lot of people, I think, are reporters because they find excitement and selfish satisfaction saying, hey, I know something you don't know. Let me tell you. Reporters tend to be um, somewhat insecure people, get over it, can't tell it, shy people who acquire a feeling of self-importance because of what their positions allow them to witness somewhat firsthand as more years on the significant events of the world. Uh, importance by osmosis of presence that, uh, that they find satisfying. But it's basically, I think, reporters are, are, 
of people who like to be smart asses. Hey, a little bit. Let me tell you what you didn't know. Uh, if I can, if there's, that's my see the pants guess of a particular human psychology of, of good reporters. And insecure if they don't know it. I mean, they worry if they don't know. Worry if they didn't get it right. Well, the insecurity is healthy. As I said before, we turn on the tape recorder. If a, a reporter isn't constantly scared, his, his or her story may be wrong and doesn't check everything out to make dog on sure it's not wrong, then it runs a greater risk of the, of the reporter making a mistake. Would you, uh, would you recommend to your son or your daughter that, that uh, would you recommend the journalism profession? Not necessarily. Uh, I have a son and I have a daughter. I have a son who's dropping out of college uh, within the next couple of three weeks to go into the military. He just doesn't like book learning. I've got a daughter that goes through the uh, goes through the roof in all the intelligence scores and achievement scores. And I'm not sure. She may be a mathematical scientist. I don't know. I don't really care. In either case, I, I think it's now. What I find satisfying, I, I don't want to uh, suggest others would find satisfying. Um, what works for me and who I am. For people, you know, for choosing careers, it's whatever you enjoy and you're good at. Generally, they will be the same thing. If you're good at it, you'll enjoy it. And if you enjoy it, you've got a better chance of being good at it. And as long as it makes a contribution to society, which I think... I think most people want to do something that's worthwhile, i.e. others' value. Huh? Doesn't matter what it is. All right, no, no. I'm going to use up your time on your tape recorder. I'm going to tell you a couple of those old, down-home Southern Indiana stories. The movie The Last Picture Show, Sam the Lion, in a little town in Archer City, Texas. That's the real name of the town. We had a last picture show in Oaktown, Indiana. Saturday nights only, dime for a ticket, one projector during the feature, which was generally a, with the uh, with the serial Tom Mix. That's how far I go back. Before there was going to be a three reel show, and you'd sell popcorn while the one projector was rewinding before you changed the reels. Saturday nights only. And I, I ran the last picture show, 14, 15 years old, for a man who was probably the shyest man in town. His name was Carl Campaign. Lived in one of those uh, old gothic, small, musty frame homes with his uh, widowed mother who was probably getting close to 80. And Carl Campaign was one of the shyest, slender, balding, short, insignificant looking person. And, you know, the sort of person, two people walk down the street, he's the one who steps aside. Um, spinster, male spinster. Home, living room, filled musty newspapers. And his rejection slips from the New Yorker magazine, writing his, he showed them to me once, writing his, they were awful, variations on uh, Dorothy Parker's Men Don't Make Passes and Women Who Wear Glasses. I think I'm one of the few people in town who knew Carl Campaign secret. He graduated with his doctoral degree in astronomical mathematics from Princeton University, doctoral degree, at the age of 19. He had his bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago at the age of 15. His parents had been professors at the University of Chicago. They bought that small farm in Southern Indiana to retire. And he sort of fled back with them from Princeton. I read his dissertation. The mathematics of Red Drift. And he didn't miss, my goodness, in the 20s. Man never dared. Hid from himself and hid from the world. When owned the last picture show. There's another guy in my home. And his name is Bruce Wilson. He's a classmate of mine. He grew up in a chicken coop. Five kids and two parents in a chicken coop. 
what you call tenement farmers. The chicken coop had been converted to a one-room house for seven people on this farm where the Wilsons farmed it for the owner. Bruce, when he was lucky, made D's in school and never had enough to eat and had bad teeth. And wasn't all that bright, let's face it. Whether it's been genes or nutrition or environment or whatever, he had trouble with studies. Today he owns his own truck. Cross-country independent driver. He made it. He's a greater success in the world, in my eyes, than Carl Campbell ever was. I think because of the distance he had to come and did, he accomplished more than anybody else in my high school class. There's only 23 kids down there, but he's my success story. He made himself a comfortable life, doing something he enjoys, find satisfying, and satisfying, worthwhile. Takes pride in hauling stuff coast to coast. And owns the truck himself. Now that's he asked me if people should be reported. Nah, do what they enjoy and what they're good at. And make a contribution, simple as that. That's what I feel. I need to use up the time of your tape recorder with that. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate the time you've given me. Okay. Is that all? Was that easy? Yeah, it was that easy. Okay.